context, everybody has to agree which hash function it is. So I also need to have this big, huge representation available. So the basic idea in all this stuff is that we define H via uh, a comparatively small random C. And what do we mean by that? That's again, this is just to reestablish terminology based, losing some of the thing, uh, things that have been said before, so the classic example.
fairly easy to do. But then we have other situations like linear probing, where we do know that we need higher independence. Right? So he proved that we could do with seven independence. Okay, but seven independence, instead of just having a linear problem, we would need to have a polynomial of degree six, which is much more painful to compute. Right? So what you would typically do here is if you want to do linear probing, and what you start with is a is that what you say some very complicated keys for which it's hard to get such that are so sort of painful to hash. We don't want to do a degree six polynomial over some really some things from a really large domain because each multiplication requires many multiplications by the computer. So what we want to do instead is we want to for linear probing. What we would typically do is if we would take an other, if we follow Rasmus' example, we'll take a seven independent hash function, capital H, just to indicate how complicated it is, that takes us from n cubed and then into, in this example, 2n, right? And then what we really use is the composed hash function, which is just that you take x and map it into capital H of uh, the signature of H. Okay, so we just do this combination. And because each key got a different value here, it's valid to just apply <coughs> our complex hash function to the results of this thing here. Okay? And this is why it's so crucial to we only need to learn how to do collision free hashing for very complex domains. Right? That's the only property we need because we're just going to compose it with whatever complex hash function we need later. Okay, so that's why we should be particularly interested in learning how to do universal hash function with low collision problems. In fact, there's a result I did which uh, says that, funnily enough, it even suffices like this if what you don't want is linear probing. And it seems like, what am I doing the last step for, right? Because I already cut this thing down to n, I introduced a lot of collisions. I mean, if I map from n keys into n different values, I expect lots of collisions, right? But it turns out that this thing here is then really just, oh, we can say two way, whatever. This thing still has the property of shuffling things around, and this shuffling around turns out to be sufficient to make sure that linear probing works anyway. So it's actually not the problem that we introduce collisions, but as you may recall with linear probing, the problem with linear probing is you have here sort of indicating that guys have hashed into uh, different values, you sort of smear things out, right? Like a bottom map, and you just mix things down, right? We take all these guys. If this location was fixed, this guy has to go down here, this guy has to go down here. If there are two up here, there might be one that has to go further ahead. This smearing out is what you do with linear probing, and that's why you need a highly complex hash function, like seven independence, five independence would suffice, in order to get linear probing to work. But just using the shoveling with a complex hash function at the end does suffice. So this is a motivation for being interested in not just making these highly dependent hash functions. I mean, one thing is it's limited how independent hash functions we can get. Because you have independence k, at least you need to store k random variables. So you don't want to have sort of unlimited independence. You just can't do that. But so the other point is just that you typically need, you need this as first step, and then you can focus all the complex hash functions on these much smaller domains. So typically you can assume you're just dealing with 64 bit integers or something simple. So this was the motivation for caring about these guys. I think you can use the bottom in the sign package to get out of that. Thank you. So So 
standard, in a standard programming language like C, so I'm just talking about simple protocol code, uh, is mod to the document. Okay, so uh, it's often called this task. Now you can see where some of the issue is. Well, he, he used a double word multiplication, so double 64 bit uh, thing. And if you can get such an answer, then if it, and, and x just starts being a 31 bit number, uh, a 32 bit number, then everything works out. But generally, you need a multiplication that can handle things that are four times as long as a key you start with. You have two issues. One is that because of the prime thing, you have to deal with a domain that's bigger than the word thing. And on top of that, you need to be able to multiply two numbers. But it turns out that for this, if what we want is a universal caching, which is just low collision probability, then we have a much, much faster scheme, which is just A times X shift, shift W minus L. Okay, so here, both of these things are W bit numbers. Then what we do is we throw away some bits. These are shifted out. Okay. So then we are left with the bits that start from here and go to W minus L. Okay. That's all what the code does if you think more like a computer. If you want to think of it as a mathematician, you would say something that looks curved, looks complicated. And we would say A times X mod 2 to W. say that A is equal to 1 plus 2B. 
writing that y minus x, which is equal to uh, z times 2 to the i, if you want to write that, Less than equal 
two, two divided by two, two L. Okay. But it's sort of a very different view from the usual mathematics when you start playing with these things here. They're extremely useful for computers. And at first you think it looks a little bit strange what's going on, but it's not that bad. We base all we did was that for the analysis here, we had square root and square, so we just use that any numbers relatively prime to a prime number, obviously. And here you use that odd number is relatively prime to any power of two. That's the only thing you use here because then we pick out the odd component, so to say. That's what I mean by saying that you throw away these zeros so this sort of odd component here. You multiply that with it. So first you keep one part of it, so you keep the one that goes down here. And now you multiply it with the uniform number. That was this part here. You add something uniform. And if you're lucky, you've got to keep the one when you, because you didn't shift out enough, then things were for sure different, and otherwise you shift out from, say, from here or something like that, but then the things you added was uniform plus something below that could be to some rounding. Okay. And again, this scheme is very fast. Of course, you could be in a situation where you're dealing with very small numbers so that you could do the multiplication just with a single multiplication, but the basic point is if you have the capacity of dealing with double-digit numbers, then you just need one multiplication in exactly that domain. So whatever works for your registers, you can work with it directly. Okay. So this is an example of extremely fast hashing uh, when it's just universal. And I will not get into any of the details of it, but we can actually also get strongly universal hashing, and you only have to change the scheme a little bit. So this thing is only universal. Um, let me just, just give me one second, I'll go on. So again, um, last we talked about uh, two independent hashing, so strong universal hashing is the same as two independent hashing. We just want this property, and when you hash two different keys, they hash totally independently and uniform.
that same thing.
sample elements. Yeah, we just sample these elements and we're seeing how many we get. And we have an expectation which is NP. It's but it's NP. And the amount we expect to deviate by that is only the square root. Here comes also an important application of two independence. The point is, if we're having vectors, and uh, vector hat. Okay. So we have some vector x, which is equal to x normal. Thing is this thing here would not work if we 
And so these things were found an efficient way of hashing up to be different uh, values. In fact, it, it's kind of clear that you do a little bit better. So what you would really do if you had a scheme like this one here, and here comes a cool trick in a second, which is just here that we have x1, Actually, 
much looks like what we used to do when uh, we wanted to have a D-independent scheme, except we have switched the roles between the coefficients and the variable. <coughs> okay. And what's the point here? The point is that if you have an x which is different from y, let's just say they have the same length, then the probability that h of x is equal to h of y is at most d divided by p. And why is that? That's just because um, we're basically just subtracting two polynomials and we're wandering. And so, so this is just some polynomials by describing where the xi's or yi's becomes coefficients. And, uh, and those two polynomials is, get, and then we're applying an argument a. And the number of zeros of such polynomials is just at most a degree. So this is just equal to the degree divided by p. That's an upper bound on the probability that two different strings have the same value. Okay, so this is sort of the instance of this whole simple limit that basically just takes, plugs in a random variable into a polynomial and asks it to get to zero. Okay, I think I will. Uh, so this is what you should know about variable and string hashing. And the last thing I want to say is is that what you do in practice is that we had this scheme over there, which was very, so we had, we had fast hash of, say, d less than equal to some upper bound d. Works. That's just this scheme. Where we are willing to store a coefficient for every single word that we want to hash. So we have that very efficient. So this thing here is kind of slow. I complained about before that we want to do things by P, you involve the same primes, all this kind of stuff. It's going to be rather slow. So what you do is that we have a fast hash function that's just called H that works for this up to this many words. What you do is that when you have a long string, Simple thing, simplest thing was collision free. We saw the 
nice thing was that to deal with W bit keys, we only had to do a W bit modification. Then we went to strong universal hashing, which has some extra power. The annoying thing was we ended up using two W bit modification. But at least when we were dealing with strings, we could take two things at a time and only pay for one, so it didn't become that bad. And then we got this strong universal hashing. And the nice thing about the strong universal hashing, it gave us the test, it allowed us to do sampling, implement sampling, so that we got chip chat and stuff like that, so we know that the variance, we know that the variance is bounded. We can kind of trust our estimates. You're going to get an exercise on that. <coughs> but the other nice thing we use of this strong universal hashing, which is also something you don't get just from local issues, is that we could compose things. We could just do vector hashing. We could just say you have a vector of words, and we could just hash them one by one with an independent hash function and X all the results in the old dot. And then the last thing we said, well, what do you do if you want to do variable string and hashing? And then I'm thinking of something like if you want to hash a book, right? A really long thing. You want to get a signature of a book so that if somebody else comes with a book and you have just stored the signatures you have, then you can just see, have I seen it somewhere else? And you can do that very quickly. Okay. So the point is, if you want to be ready to hash books, having a whole book full of uh, W bit numbers, well, I guess it's not that bad for a computer, but at least the principle is kind of annoying have so many things lying around. So then you need something which allows you to handle variable length strings, and then you can use a scheme like this one, which is a really cool idea. It's unfortunately pretty slow in the sense that the price you pay to hash each word is you end up doing this multiplication modular of prime, which is just a pretty hefty price to pay. So you don't want to do that everywhere. So all you just do is to say, well, we can, we can divide the things into blocks, and you just hash each because the point is, if I have two different strings and they're different somewhere, there will be at least one block in which they differ. And as long as you don't get any collisions in, that, in those blocks, then the strings of signatures will still remain different. And then I just need to hash these strings of signatures, and I'm all done. Okay. And these are, I know it's a lot of sort of, you can call them silly small tricks or whatever, like this thing here from crypto, which I think is really cool, but it did save a fact of two and stuff like that. And also because, yeah, these things are open bottlenecks. Like at ATT, we had to do a lot of hashing of internet traffic. And the point is, when traffic soon through a router, you can't ask the traffic to stop because you want to take notes. Either you're fast enough or you're not. And then the whole thing is just lost. Okay, so um, this concludes what I want to talk about with the strong universality and the universality thing, and I have an exercise for you.